Um, okay, welcome to this, uh, our second webinar in the Future Research Series webinars, which will run through uh, September, October and November. I'm really excited to introduce this session on driving behaviour change, where we will look at uh, what it is that shapes behaviour and drives behaviour change, both for us as individuals, but also for companies, uh, for organisations, for consumers and for the public. Through this webinar, we'll get to understand how via a MAPS framework, it is possible not only to diagnose the kind of broad range of influences that influence behaviour, but also to use this as a foundation to devise strategies for successful behaviour change. Uh, there is a chat function, so do add your questions as we go on and we'll come back to them at the end. Um, but what I want to do now is introduce our two speakers for the session. Uh, so we have Colin Strong, who's head of our behavioural science unit, and Tamara Ansons, who is a consultant within the unit at Ipsos Mori. So over to you, Colin and Tamara. Great. Thanks very much, Pippa. Um, good to be here. Um, we certainly, as we all know, uh, live in some interesting times. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, a way of uh, considering this and thinking about this is um, uh, perhaps the liquid times. Um, uh, just to explain this a little bit, that even before coronavirus, there were a, a, a range of different um, uh, a, a range of different um, influences um, uh, shaping our environment, such as um, uh, such as climate change, such as demographic shifts, uh, digital disruption, um, and, and it's created what sociologist Zygat Bauman has called this kind of liquid environment, um, where we are subject to this pretty much permanent change and having to live without the fixed, predictable patterns which perhaps we want did, once did. And so navigating the environment means that perhaps we can't rely on the habits and routines of the past. We continually have to work those out and continually have to navigate change. Um, and, and this really provides the backdrop um, for what we want to talk about. And of course, uh, at the sort of uh, uh, pinnacle of this is coronavirus, which has fundamentally changed the environment which we're in. So we can just see that the historical context in which we are now living um, and has been incredibly polarised is all about how do we go about navigating change. Um, and this is the this is the backdrop to uh, the way in which we practice um, a lot of the behavioral science work which we do here at Ipsos. It's all about often about facilitating change and using the science of behavior to understand how do we actually go about doing that? How do we go about understanding behavior, but using that understanding importantly to help navigate change to reach more positive outcomes? Now, we're going to start off with a little little bit of a quiz, and we will we'll, the the reasons for this quiz will become apparent a little bit later on. Um, but the uh, but but um, uh, for now, uh, I'm going to pose the question of how long does it actually take, in your opinion, to form a habit? Um, and uh, a range of answers here. Um, maybe it's 10 days, 21 days, uh, 50 days. Uh, 10,000 hours or something else, or perhaps you don't know. So have a think about it. Um, feel free to um, uh, pop an answer in the chat or, or just um, uh, just uh, uh, bank that one for later on, because we'll come back to this question um, about uh, about sort of forming habits and perhaps sort of challenging some of the notions uh, uh, implied within this. So Perhaps a lot of the time when uh, we talk about behavioral science is that it's tempting to focus on more automatic, non-conscious mechanisms. Um, and so this is the notion popularized by Daniel Kahneman um, that we've got um, an awful lot happening under the surface. And um, some of those very popular notions that something like 95% of our behavior is non-conscious and automatic. Um, and that's the default mechanisms that we 
creed that we use to live by. Um, whilst um, uh, when something unusual happens, uh, then we're kicked into system two, um, more reflective, more thoughtful uh, patterns. Um, and so you can see the nature, the, the, the notion here that these more automatic behaviors are both the way in which we go about navigating the environment, um, but also the way in which this is somehow passively shaped. So we, our behaviors are somewhat shaped by the environment which we're in without us being aware of it. And this is, uh, just to add to that, this is very much reflected in how we typically uh, talk about habits. So habits are uh, typically thought of as being shaped by the environment in terms of the stimulus uh, that triggers a certain behavior uh, and the rewards uh, that reinforce that behavior. And through repetition over time, uh, these behaviors uh, get deeply embedded and they become what we would call habits. Now, this is a very passive way that an ind individual is involved in formation of their habits. And we challenge this by, by offering a slightly different view of habits, one in which these habits are formed um, through the reflection of how we uh, master our environment. So take riding our bikes, for example. So um, when we first learn how to ride a bike, uh, we have to think really carefully about how we uh, position ourselves on the, on the bike itself, how we pedal the pedals um, in order to ensure that we don't fall over. But as we gain this skill, as we become more uh, masters of this environment, we're able to um, forget about those details and we can think about other things. Uh, so we can have a conversation with our friend, we can maybe do tricks, uh, we can maybe go on more challenging terrain. And so this habit of riding your bike gradually becomes uh, one that we've mastered uh, so that we can devote our cognitive resources to other things. Uh, and this is reflected in other, other types of uh, behaviors as well. So take Barack Obama, for example. Um, so what we see with him is that um, he has uh, got into the routine or the habit of wearing uh, only gray or blue, blue suits. So that way he's not having to think about the clothing that he's wearing. Rather, he's devoting his cognitive resources to the other important decisions that um, a president should be focused on. Now we can see this in a range of other behaviors and we're just gonna show a quick video now. So it'll just be a moment as that pops up. Okay, so in this video, what you'll see is there's a monkey that's receiving a cucumber for performing a trick. So the monkey on the left will receive the cucumber uh, and is very happy the first time that he receives that reward. But what you'll notice is that the, the monkey on the right uh, receives uh, a different reward. He'll receive a, a grape. And in the monkey world, this grape is uh, a, a higher value reward. Um, and so what's important to notice is how, uh, when this environment changes that the, the monkey's operating in, the meaning of that reward uh, fundamentally changes and that results in, in a change in their behavior. So the first time the trick is performed, happily receives the cucumber and watch the monkey on, uh, the right that now receives the grape, the monkey on the left notices that, goes ahead and performs the trick again, receives the cucumber, and is no longer satisfied with that. So I hope that this is a sort of a playful uh, sort of illustration, but uh, I hope that that illustrates how you know the meaning of these rewards aren't necessarily given. Rather, we impose meaning based on our understanding um, of that reward itself and the context in which we are in. So I'll just turn back to Colin uh, to take over the the next slide now. Okay, so you can see uh, at at play um, at uh, it uh, in real time how. Um, uh, navigating change is so uh, uh, so requires requires a lot of um, uh, being very uh, adapting to the environment adapting to the environment in which we're in. Um, uh, so just as much with the technology which we're using as it is for the um, uh, as it is for the uh, uh, rewards with uh, grapes or cucumbers. So we can see that. Um, uh, we return to this question then of how long does it actually take to form a habit? Um, well, perhaps hopefully we've, we've, we've started to make the case that um, it, it's actually 
um, uh, is less straightforward an answer than perhaps you might first expect. Um, the popular answer here is 21 days, um, and and I guess many of you may have answered uh, answered that, and, um, uh, and and fairly understandably, this is a this is an answer which has been around since 1960s, um, and it comes actually from a book called Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, um, and. Uh, uh, he he, um, uh, he, he um, uh, references 21 days, but it's got absolutely zero uh, evidence sitting behind it. And um, uh, more recent work uh, suggests that it's anything from 18 days to 254 days. So why do we make this point? I, I guess the point is that is that behavior isn't just something that necessarily happens as a function of the environment which we're in. Um, we have to remember that there's a human at the very heart of this um, and the human will have views on whether or not they want to do that behavior, whether they feel able to do that behavior, are they the kind of person who would be doing this behavior and so on. And so I think there's lots of issues there which should be very familiar to people working in consumer insights that the, the question of how long does it take to form a habit is a little bit, it depends and it depends upon the behavior, it depends upon the environment and it depends upon the person um, who's, who's undertaking that behavior. So we can, we can perhaps just sum up um, this bit of um, theory here, but useful and important to understand the context um, with three key points is that first of all, um, the theories of behavior which um, uh, are typically drawn automatic processes, look, they are useful, they're helpful, but they're not the full story. They often explain, they're very good at explaining behavior in quite um, uh, sort of structured and predictable environments, and which is what we're kind of in a lot of the time, but not all of the time. And in actual fact, as we, as hopefully all picked up from the, from the sort of um, uh, looking at some of the video there, is that we and animals are adaptive. We look for ways to master our environment. We're proactive, not just reactive. If we get the grape and if we don't get the cucumber, not the grape, we'll be banging our hands and sort of saying, hang on, I need to, I need, I need my fair share and I need to understand what's going on. So we look to master and shape the environment which we're in. And there's a person at the heart of this. And so this is why we need a holistic understanding of how do we go about changing our behavior. So that's the background and that's the context and the sort of theoretical understanding and hopefully that gives you a, a, a bit of a sense of, of where we're heading but maybe if we just turn now to well look what does our practice look like how does that translate into what we actually do um, and uh, there's, a, there's three key steps which we reference in order to drive behavior change first is diagnose What's going on? What's what's sitting underneath the behaviour which we're which we're observing? And of course, we do this in everyday life um, with each other. But what we're trying to do here is to do this systematically and using a scientific un, um, uh, underpinning to help us understand diagnose correctly what's happening because if we don't diagnose correctly we can't design and design the interventions in order to facilitate change which then go on to um, being activated and so we refine and optimize them and, and roll them out so diagnose design deliver are our key touch points here touchstones so perhaps easiest just to demonstrate this and talk about this in the context of something tangible and we'll talk about a brand example then we'll talk briefly about a uh, public sector example um, so here um, the the brand example is that of recipe boxes um, many of you will be familiar with recipe boxes um, they um, uh, you know you, you get your ingredients um, for a meal um, along with obviously a recipe um, and um, uh, and that's delivered to you it's um, uh, to your home um, and uh, uh, they've been around for a little while um, but there's been a massive spike in them during lockdown um, uh, a, a company mindful chef reported a 425 percent increase so the behavior change challenge here is perhaps slightly different it's not about starting a behavior people have started that but how do you go about maintaining that behavior um, and here this is where we need to then say well look first of all what's sitting underneath this you know what what helps us to understand this behavior how can we better kind of characterize it and this is the diagnosis you know what are the determinants and so there's five key elements first of all motivation do i want to do it if you don't want to do it you're unlikely to do it if ability you've got to be able to do it you've got to be an act to enact it 
processing we touched on it a bit earlier but it's how do we think about it and how do we um do it is it is it something we need to stop and dwell on or is it something we can do more automatically um and then what about the the more external factors the physical um, environment in which we're in does the does the context actually allow it can I get them delivered to me is a key question, for example, or social, what are other people doing? And I think we've become familiar with actually what other people do and cultural values are an important part and shape a determinant of our behavior. Now, we don't want to drown you with detail, um, so we won't, but just to make you aware that sitting underneath these, there is further sub-dimensions. Um, and so, so, so be aware that we drill down and we, can have a, we need to have a very rigorous, careful understanding and inspection to see, well, what's going on? You know, how, can we, how can we use this model in order to rigorously um, diagnose what's sitting underneath behavior? Because this is critical for behavior change. This is based on um, academic work um, and uh, empirical evidence to suggest that if we get these right, then we can get sustained behavior change. Over to you, Tamara. So as, as Colin was saying, um, if we use this framework as a way to diagnose uh, behavior, we can drill down and understand uh, what is actually influencing and shaping behavior. So take the recipe boxes, for example. We can use this framework to unpick um, some qualitative research that we may be conducting. So if I'm somebody that's been adopting these recipe boxes over the recent months, we can look at my motivation to see if I'm sufficiently motivated and want to engage in this activity over the long term. And what we may realize is that um, on one level, I might have sufficient motivation is that I understand that I'm going to eat better um, in, in um, if I use these recipe boxes um, and cook for myself. However, I may also have some emotions that are not um, acting well and encouraging me to adopt, adopt this behavior over the long term, uh, as I may feel quite anxious about having to do this every day. That may feel quite uncomfortable and quite daunting. Um, if we go further and look at ability, uh, we may see that um, I know what I need to do in order to enact this behavior. So I seem to understand what I need to be doing. It seems to fit well into my routines uh, and what I typically do. Um, also, if we look at processing, uh, as this is something I've been doing, um, I've figured it out quite well. So I don't need to continue to uh, think about it too carefully. And I can think about it in a fairly automatic way. Um, however, if we look at the uh, physical environment, um, what we may see is that um, the, having these boxes that I have to store every week is a bit of a pain and I don't really have a place that I can easily store it in my kitchen. So that might be a hindrance in terms of adopting this behavior over the long term. Also, if you look at social influences, I may look around and see people like me in my neighborhood uh, that seem to be stopping to use these boxes. Uh, and so I may look to them and think uh, that I'm, I may not continue to do this myself. And so as you can hopefully see, using this framework and drilling down to the different uh, subdimensions, we can start to see a range of influences that are helping this behavior be enacted in the long term. But importantly, we can identify the key barriers that are perhaps preventing this behavior from being enacted over the long term. And so if we use those barriers um, as, as our diagnosis, we then can uh, design interventions that are precisely targeted at those barriers uh, so that we can effectively support uh, behavior change over the long term. And I think this is where the real um, uh, power of a behavior change system maps really kicks in because um, we can uh, go in a systematic way um, from that diagnosis, as Tamara was saying, through to designing of the intervention. So each of the different dimensions has intervention guidance. So if this is the issue, this is the this is the um, diagnosis. This is the treatment. This is the intervention advice. Um, and so um, so we can move in, in a in a very agile way from just un, from from understanding behaviour, which is important, to changing behaviour. So in this instance, um, with motivation and in and and uh, emotion, um, well, to help manage anxiety. So it's all about management of that um, uh, of that emotion. Perhaps there's ways in which you can kind of build a sense of control, which is a classic intervention strategy 
um, around around this by providing a leftover meal planner because people, if the people are anxious about this, about um, uh, how many meals they're going to have to cook, well, actually giving people a sense of control that you can use it in other in other contexts is going to be helpful. Um, similarly, um, in terms of environment led design, there are all sorts of um, guidance around how to reshape the environment. And so, if you haven't got, if your design, if your box doesn't sort of fit in your kitchen, of course, we can't go redesigning people's kitchens, but we can perhaps give some guidance on how to redesign the box so it can be shaped for easy storage. Similarly, with um, social, um, and then there's the uh, issue about well, seeing other people do this thing, and maybe it's not. Maybe I'll, I'll follow follow their follow their lead. As you know, we all know that that is a that is an influence on behaviour. Perhaps what we can do is to show other people continuing to use the boxes and reinforcing the norms which we're which we're hoping to um, to, to um, deliver on so you can see that the way in which we deliver interventions isn't necessarily just one thing they can be multifaceted and they can be cover a number of different areas uh, so so that 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 allows us to um, uh, uh, not only understand behavior holistically but address it holistically um, and then of course once we've got all these different um, means available to us in order to be able to um, uh, address uh, the, the the challenge. Then, of course, we need to say, look, which ones do we roll with? You know, which which blueprints are going to be helpful? You know, which ideas are going to be helpful? Which do we take forward? Okay, we'll take a smaller number forward. Um, we can iterate, um, develop them, uh, create prototypes, and test them. So you can see the way in which this whole thing operates on this end-to-end -end thing. From de from we we can define the behaviour we're trying to um, influence or maintain through to diagnosing it, designing interventions, and and then deliver, delivering it. So we have a we have a public sector example here, um, Tamara. Yeah. So the previous example we just talked to talked through was looking at how we apply this framework in a more qualitative setting. Um, but in this example, what we've actually done is applied it in a quantitative way. So we had survey uh, items uh, that we used to measure the various uh, dimensions, um, the different maps dimensions that shape behavior. And what we were interested in exploring is comfort with uh, resuming normal activities as countries came out of lockdown. And so what we looked at were 27 countries. Um, and what we found is that overall, um, about 60% um, of people said that they were comfortable resuming uh, normal activities as lockdown was, was easing. Uh, now, what we were interested in understanding is what was driving this uh, comfort in resuming uh, normal activities. And so, as I said, we applied maps using um, survey items in order to unpack these different influences. We may think that, um, sort of just based on our own, own assumptions and without doing a proper diagnosis, uh, that this behavior, so resuming normal activities, is one that is very much influenced by very visceral factors, so things like emotion and your internalized motivation. Um, however, what we found uh, in our research uh, were to be the key factors across most of the 27 countries, in fact, uh, were far more deliberative factors, so things like uh, whether you expected engagement engaging in these uh, normal activities to be safe, whether you felt that you had the capabilities or the skills to manage uh, this new environment uh, were key determinants in shaping um, your comfort with resuming normal activities. Now, this is really important to know because this allows uh, brands and governments uh, to introduce um, the, the right targeted approaches to help support people in engaging in normal activities again. So again, uh, in order to engage in these activities again, these more deliberative factors seem to be really key uh, in, in shaping that behavior. And so they should be reflected in interventions that are developed uh, to shape that behavior. So if we go back to Colin. So, um, uh, thanks, Tamara. We, we've used this um, in lots of different situations. Um, so, um, and as you can see here, um, the way in which we can apply this in quite a few different behaviour change challenges. So, um, something which is very topical at the moment is hygiene. Um, how can children be encouraged to engage in regular hand washing, for example, um, is, uh, is something which is absolutely critical behaviour change in the environment which we're, which we're currently living in. Public transport, as governments, um, uh, employers uh, are, are seeking to re-navigate and rethink about, look, how do we 
um, uh, operate in this sort of environment, um, then uh, helping people to at least navigate and understand how to use public transport and to um, facilitate usage of this um, in a way where people are comfortable is, is a, an absolutely critical area. We're doing work on that in the UK, Australia, New Zealand and Canada, um, lots of activity in that space. Um, similarly, financial well-being, um, uh, uh, another kind of key area um, which is going to, as we're all aware, is going to be um, uh, a, 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 uh, an ongoing behavior change challenge in that how can you facilitate people um, uh, managing savings, managing pensions, um, and just generally managing their day-to-day -day expenses in, a, in an optimal way. And just to add uh, to the examples that Colin spoke to, um, we also have uh, recently done some work looking at cybersecurity. Um, so, you know, looking at how we can encourage people to adopt a range of cybersecurity measures, such as using strong passwords uh, or using different passwords across different accounts. Um, oftentimes, um, applications tend to be focused on nudge-like interventions. Um, but what we found with that uh, in doing a proper diagnosis of the influences that shape the behavior there is that there's a lot of social influences that shape that behavior. And so it's important to think about how social might be uh, another uh, way to influence people to adopt uh, cybersecurity behaviors. Uh, if we move over to vaccines, uh, which is another context where we've applied this thinking, uh, and again, we see that um, you know social is a hugely influential, influential uh, driver in shaping uh, vaccine decisions. And so it's not just a purely a decision that's made uh, by an individual in isolation, it's very much embedded within their social and cultural uh, context. Uh, and then finally, if we look at a slightly different example with household goods, uh, we've actually been applying maps uh, as part of an innovation process. So rather than innovating a product uh, and then hoping behaviors will change uh, to uh, lead to the adoption of that, of that new product, we're actually embedding behavior change thinking into how those products are being innovated. So that behavior change thinking is, is deeply ingrained in the innovation itself, uh, rather than something that gets added on after the fact. So lots of ways in which we can apply this framework um, usefully. Um, and I think that the key point which we want to make and hopefully of, um, is, is coming across is that um, behavior change framework like this allows us to look at behavior with a much more holistic lens than perhaps some of the other narrower, more automatic explanations of behavior, which you sometimes hear about with behavioral science. Those are part of the explanation, but by no means all of the explanation. And by doing that, then that means we can identify what is really going on, you know, and all the wide range of different levers of behavior which are, which, are, which are happening, including those more automatic mechanisms. And importantly, with that, we can use our diagnosis to design interventions, and those interventions will then have an impact on outcomes. So this is the sort of sequence which is critical to think through and get right um, in, when delivering behavior change programs. Just to round off, a quick word on where do we see this moving next? And um, I think we talk a lot about, um, and, and government is more familiar perhaps with the challenges around behavior change and, and where that's moving. Perhaps a little bit less is said about brands and their facilitating purposeful change. And um, I, I think that as we saw earlier on with the liquid landscape which we're in, um, we have a window at the moment uh, of what's often called unthawing, you know, this idea that actually we can suddenly, after a long period of time where we do things in a certain way, um, suddenly change is happening and what happens in the short term can become a fixture of life. Um, so we're, we're in this kind of fast forwarding liquid environment um, where, where things, are, things are rapidly changing. Um, and perhaps that reflects the way also that for all of us, perhaps, we're starting to rethink a little bit. We're having to re-navigate. Things have freed up. Um, we can start seeing things a little bit more clearly. And um, one of the things which we are starting to see is the way in which consumers are perhaps looking at their own behavior and thinking about the values that sit underneath those behaviors and thinking, well, actually, maybe I want to change my life. And you can see here the way in which um, almost half the people globally that we did in this global study that we talked to are thinking about making major changes or completely changing their lives, which is a phenomenal number. So you've 
you've got a very um, uh, you've got a community of people here who are looking to enact change in their lives, which is an important consideration. And importantly for brands, because what we're seeing, and this is this is some US data that applies in other markets as well from, from work we've done, is that people are looking to brands to help them facilitate change and navigate change. You know, saying, look, look you've got a responsibility to help me. I'm interested in hearing from you and I want to hear about what you've got on offer. So there is a role, an important role emerging here for brands. But also, importantly, um, one of the other associated changes which we've seen is adoption of online. And here, obviously, e-commerce penetration has gone um, in the early days of lockdown to sort of went, went up massively. So the important point here, and it, we're seeing this, these levels maintain pretty solidly at the moment, the important point is that there is a means by which brands and consumers can, in, can, can um, communicate in a more bi-directional way. So it's not quite so broadcast. Now, of course, we've always had that to some extent, but we've seen a massive increase in this recently. So the, the points which we perhaps would take out of here would be, we are seeing people um, examine the behaviors and think about the underlying set of values that they represent. And we've seen that, of course, in huge social justice movements globally. There is a window for change. Consumers are looking for brands um, not only that reflect their values, but importantly, shifting on from that to help them to start and maintain more purposeful behaviors. Um, and as that behavior is mediated via digital, there is a new opportunity. There's a new uh, means by which um, uh, more purposeful behavior change can be driven. So we've covered a lot of ground. There's a lot of territory here to, to um, think through and hopefully we've given you a sense of um, the trajectory um, of, of how we see things because at the heart of all this is change. We're living in a world which involves navigating constant change. Consumers are having to do this brand and, and brand governments in, in combination with consumers are a part of the solution here. But in order to do that, we need means by um, uh, the, the rules of understanding the game. We need to understand how to navigate change. And to do that, we need holistic approaches. And the discipline of behavior change underpinned by behavioral science is rapidly emerging as the key way to really do this and create impact. Thank you so much for listening to, um, listening to us today. Great. Thank you, uh, Colin, Tamara. I think if we just switch our cameras on, we've had quite a flurry of questions come in. Um, but I think it's fascinating. You know, behavior is so incredibly complicated. And whether you're talking about vaccinating your children or returning to the shops or, you know, filling in your tax returns or buying a different brand, the dynamics of what comes into play and what's important is totally different. And having that framework around which you can uh, as you say, diagnose and then look at interventions. Um, so I have a few questions um, here, which I'd like to uh, hand over to you. So when were you looking at the key factors behind people's comfort with returning to normal activities? Did we see any country differences? And, you know, for example, uh, with God, how well people think that the government had handled the situation? In, in, in the, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do an initial answer and then let um, Tamara come in. But the, um, uh, in the work which we did, what we were trying to do is to understand what the, um, what the uh, issues were sitting underneath um, resuming normal activities, for want of a better term. Um, so we didn't make um, any assertions about um, how governments had performed. What we were able to see is that those somewhat more functional um, uh, needs that people have, or the, spunk, or the dimensions sitting underneath in, in underneath behaviour, were critical in a fairly consistent way across geographies. Um, I think that's the case, right, Tamara? Uh, that was certainly the case. I think that came out uh, to be the sort of the key drivers uh, across the countries that we polled fairly consistently. Um, there was some slight variation 
um, I would say in terms of uh, the, the stage at which each of these countries were in terms of the progress through the pandemic. Um, so I think what we saw um, at the time that we polled uh, with China, for example, um, I think there was a bit more of a um, social influence as well going on. Um, and so I think that po possibly reflects the fact that they were at the time um, resuming normal activities. And so that, that uh, meant that that influence was more reflected in, in the data that we collected. Okay. And so I suppose kind of linked to that question, if you were doing a behavior change um, kind of study to understand about all the all the factors and where to prioritize and what the interventions might look like. Uh, depending on the cat category or sector, you would need to do that differently in each market. Well I think I think having that the beauty of having a consistent framework is that you know how to frame the questions. So you can do that yeah. consistently in each market and then understand the way in which um, that will recognizing that of course you're going to have to phrase those slightly differently by market, but essentially the work which we do um, typically involves um, uh, trying to keep that to a minimum so you can be comparable. Um, I think that the and, and, and then you can see the way in which the dimensions sitting underneath behavior vary by market, which of course they, they will. Um, uh, often, but not always. Um, and of course, yes, there are some variants by market, but it's you know we can we can see a consistent pattern. I think the the the, the place where you get uh, quite a bit of variation is on the delivery aspect because um, uh, it, it's or, or des designing of the interventions because of course what will work in one country will not work in another necessarily. So so we can kind of give guidance in terms of um, well, what are the dimensions sitting underneath behaviour and here's the sort of intervention guidance which you which will um, uh, which which will work but how you deliver that um, will vary um, uh, by the country which you're in okay I also had a slightly different question um, that's come through so we talked about behavior change with uh, you know customers and consumers or um, but can behavior change be applied for or within organizations as well can you use the same kind of approach yeah, absolutely. I, th I think this is uh, where this sort of framework is, is quite powerful and useful. And um, yeah, you know, we certainly see uh, in the work that we do um, applying a consistent framework to organizational behavior change uh, as being um, something that um, we draw on maps for. Um, and I think it, it, it provides, so certainly when you operate within an organization, uh, there's certain elements that are going to be more consistent across those individuals, given that we're looking at people within an organization. And so, uh, but I think nevertheless, applying this sort of individually based uh, framework uh, that unpacks the ranges, range of influences can help uh, explore that um, and, and certainly be useful in an organizational setting. Um, absolutely. Okay. Um, very diverse questions here, and I know we're going to have to sort some of these by email because we won't have time, but I had a question here. wonder whether the deliberative factors might be dependent on the population you, you sampled. So how representative were they of inequalities in society? I think I wouldn't necessarily say that the uh, I, I I'm not wouldn't necessarily um, characterize the dimensions which we're measuring as deliberative. I think that so for example, um, somebody might um, uh, reference, um, let's take a dimension, um, uh, for example, uh, identity. Um, now, I think that's a sort of classic one where somebody might um, uh, say, I'm not that kind of, you know, I'm not the sort of person to do this behavior. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and of course, you know, we would say, ah, okay, that's an identity issue and we can, we can classify it as such. So I, I think we're probably not um, uh, at the risk of, um, uh, the risk of sort of overcomplicating this. Um, I don't think we're necessarily saying that those dimensions are always uh, what we might consider to be deliberative. Um, there mm -hmm. is a slightly different axis which we're using to to, to think about them. Um, but of course, um, absolutely, uh, I, I think that um, one of the um, uh, that there is a perhaps not enough work has been done. Um, uh, within the discipline of behavioral science to understand some of the cross-cultural differences. And I think that is becoming increasingly apparent and important. And that's certainly something which we think about and, 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 and look into in reference. Uh, a lot of our work 
is cross-country um, and uh, uh, and of course what we have to do is to uh, bear in mind as much as possible uh, the cultural variations in these things and be sensitive to those um, uh, and, and try to sort of enact the different dimensions in a way which is sympathetic to the environment in which we find ourselves in. I don't think there's anything you'd add to that tomorrow. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the on that particular study that we're looking at resumption behaviors, I think it just happened that uh, the more sort of uh, thoughtful influences were mainly driving behaviors. Um, I think it probably reflected the nature of behavior that we were asking about, um, perhaps a little bit. Um, but I, I think, you know, the, the art in applying this framework is really in having the questions um, that adequately reflect the range of influences and so as Colin mentioned identity is something that um, you know is is probably not something we really carefully think about in terms of how it influences our behavior and so the art is trying to pose a question that taps into how identity might be shaping that behavior um, even though it might be not something that we think all that carefully about and really are consciously um, sort of thinking about as we engage in a behavior and so um, so I think it's you know it's all about applying a framework in a standardized way and then crafting the questions to reflect uh, the different dimensions in the context of the behavior that we're asking about. Okay, I've got a final tricky one for you. Uh, we will sort the others by email because I've got loads uh, I can see coming through. Um, so uh, how does this framework work for personas who are resistant to change and how do you navigate between this change and imposing on an individual's kind of right to choose? Yeah, so, I mean, it's you know, vaccination is a good one. It is a good one, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, it's for the good of good of the um, population. But, um, but yeah. I think I think it I think what what we're trying to do with this one is to show the ways in which you um, how you need to engage. I, I I think that the idea that you can make somebody change their behaviour or even that that is a necessarily a um, an appealing prospect is uh, certainly is is something which which is is somewhat illusory. I I, I think that. Um, uh, these are this provides directionality as to how you can engage with people in order to reach um, these sorts of outcomes. So, for example, with vaccination, there's lots of issues about beliefs around vaccination, um, perhaps cultural values, perhaps social norms. It gives you a gives you an indication of where to where to be um, uh, uh, operating and thinking and exploring and understanding um, and in, and engaging. Um, and uh, and of course, um, it's not a given that your um, intervention activity will result um, in a short-term positive outcome. Um, some things take some time to 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 um, uh, to change. Um, Tamara, anything to add to yeah, that? I mean, yeah, no, I think that that hits it quite well. But uh, I, I guess you know that you can certainly impose uh, measures and force someone to do something. Um, you know that that is not mm. a uh, <laughs> that is not not a way to enact behavior change. Um, however, if we're talking about um, having behavior change that happens over the long term, um, you know, it's not just about imposing uh, measures using external stimuli and forcing that upon someone. Um, you need somebody to become committed to engaging in that behavior. And so you don't, it's not just relying on the environment to change that behavior in a fairly passive way, but you want to get somebody to engage and think about that behavior and actively work to change their own behavior. And I think that's the that's the uh, benefit of taking a framework like ours is that, yeah, you can use it in a fairly uh, sort of externally focused way we, where we are looking at short term behavior change, where we are relying on external influences to see that behavior change happen. But we also have a route to think through how we can move from that externally imposed behavior change to something that's a bit more internally motivated and driven. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. And it, I can tell by the number of questions flying through how, you know, people's minds were firing off in different directions. But I think what was interesting that you were both talking about earlier is how in this kind of pandemic where people are feeling very uncertain, very unsettled, they're looking to brands, to organisations for that comfort about what should I do? And so, you know, in this very turbulent time, um, kind of this is more important than ever because this is an opportunity to engage 
um, you know, citizens, consumers, customers in a way that's kind of beneficial for them and will help guide them through, you know, th through this very difficult time. So thank you ever so much, Colin and Tamara. Uh, do contact Colin and Tamara. It's first name, dot surname at ipsos.com. So Colin Strong, Tamara Ansons, if you want to email them directly, but we will forward your questions as well because we can see um, as they've come through who's, who's posted them to us. Um, this is the second, as I say, in 12 webinars. We have another one tomorrow on maximizing footfall conversion. So anyone involved in retail or selling products through retail, we've got a Q&A with Watchers of Switzerland, which I hope you'll find very interesting. And then on Thursday, we have a fascinating um, webinar looking at semiotics and cultural intelligence. So some themes coming off um, from our conversation today, uh, where we have speakers from Sega Games, and uh, Avanti West Coast Trains, where they've used very different applications of semiotics and cultural intelligence to inform strategic business decisions. So do sign up to those webinars. We hope to see you there. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks very much. Thank you.